I now call to order the Society's 2386th meeting in the 146th year since its founding in 1871. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is Larry Milstein. I am the president of PSW, the oldest scientific society of Washington, D.C., committed to providing a forum to further scientific understanding and inquiry. Welcome to our members and guests to tonight's President's Lecture by Margaret Lyman in the John Wesley Powell Auditorium of the Cosmos Club in Washington, D.C., including our members and friends around the world who are watching the live stream of tonight's meeting on PSW Science's YouTube channel. Before we begin, I wanted to let you know that I am banging this meeting to order and gaveling it to adjournment with a special gavel made from timbers of the White House. All right, from the White House reconstruction in 1814, I believe, which um, were recovered during the reconstruction of the White House and the Truman administration. Is that correct? Thank you. <laughs> and every year at the President's uh, address, we use this gavel. Um, I'm not sure how long it's been in the society, but probably since the 1950s. So we'll begin with a few announcements and a reading of Joseph Henry's address to the first recorded meeting of the society on 18, 8, November 1871. We'll then turn to this evening's lecture, followed by a question and answer period. And thereafter, I will present a small thank you gift to our speaker, make a few closing announcements, and then adjourn the meeting to the social hour. Please join me in thanking the sponsors of the spring lecture series, the Policy Studies Organization in cooperation with the American Public University, and another generous donor who wishes to remain anonymous. Tonight's lecture is additionally sponsored by <laughs> Mill and White, Zolano and Brannigan, which you may all be wondering, what's Mill and White, Zolano and Brannigan? Well, it's a law firm where I happen to be a partner. So, <laughs> thank you for our sponsorship here. I am pleased to announce the following new members have been elected to the society. Guy Snodgrass, a returning member, coming back to active membership after serving overseas. Guy is Special Assistant to Secretary of Defense James Mattis. He holds a number of degrees, including a Bachelor of Science and an MS from the Naval Academy, and an MIT, I'm sorry, and an MS in Nuclear and Electrical Engineering and Computer Sciences from MIT. He is interested in computer science, especially artificial intelligence, and he has a particular interest in the science is and advancing the national interest. And tonight's speaker, Margaret Lyman, whose interests will be in part apparent from tonight's lecture. Please join me in welcoming them to the society. Uh, for any members who are here tonight who are newly elected or have been recently elected, if you did not already pick up your copy of Volume 1 of the PSW Bulletin, signed by me, please do so as a thank you for joining the Society. And with that, the corresponding secretary will now read then-President Joseph Henry's anniversary address to the Society on April, no, I'm sorry, on 18 November 1871. This was the first meeting of the society that we know of and is numbered number one in the bulletin. Robin. As President Milstein said, these are extracts from President Henry's anniversary address to the Society in 1871. Gentlemen, I have been requested to make some remarks on the character and object of this Society, which may serve to introduce it to the world. 
This society was formed by the call for a meeting of a number of gentlemen impressed with the importance of an association of a strictly scientific character in the city of Washington. At the meeting which resulted from this call, a name and a constitution were adopted for the society. And without delay, in a series of subsequent meetings, the objects of the association were prosecuted with such marked success as to fully realize the anticipations which had been entertained with regard to the enterprise. The importance of such a society must be evident to all who are acquainted with the history of science. It is mainly through the influence exerted and the assistance rendered by such associations that science is advanced and its results given to the world. It is important that those engaged in similar pursuits should have opportunities for frequent meetings at stated periods. This is more particularly the case with the cultivators of abstract science who find but comparatively few fully capable of appreciating the value of their labors, even in a community how much soever enlightened it may be on general subjects. The students of history, of literature, of politics, and of art find everywhere men who can enter in some degree into their pursuits and who can appreciate their merits and derive pleasure from their writings or conversation, while the mathematician, the astronomer, the physicist, the chemist, the biologist, and the student of descriptive natural history meet with few who have sufficient knowledge of their particular subjects to be able to award them that intelligent appreciation and encouragement essential to their sustained and laborious efforts. Furthermore, a society of this kind becomes a means of instruction to all its members, the knowledge of each becoming, as it were, the knowledge of the whole. Again, there is a common bond of union between all branches of science, since they all relate to the existence and laws of the same universe in which the more we extend our knowledge, the more we find of unity in the midst of infinite diversity. <coughs> the governing body of such a society, in order that the organization may produce the desired effect, must be largely composed of men who by education and experience in the processes of investigation are justly entitled to the appellation of scientific and who from their positive contributions to the science of the day are acknowledged by the scientific world as worthy of this distinction. The society though of a local and unostentatious character, may, if true to itself and its mission, accomplish much towards increasing the reputation of the country and influencing public opinion with regard to questions of a scientific character. However wide the diffusion of general knowledge public opinion in regard to scientific questions must eventually be determined by the authority of societies, journals, and individuals of established scientific reputation. It is therefore of the first importance that the operations of this society be conducted with great care and that nothing be given to the world under its sanction, which is not based upon thorough investigation or established scientific principles. We should be warned 
by the fate of a society established in this city some 30 years ago, which although it included among its members a few men of true science, was under the control principally of amateurs and politicians. <laughs> and therefore was unfit to discharge the duty which it claimed as one of its functions to decide questions of a strictly scientific character. It should have been borne in mind by this association that votes on questions in science should be weighed, not counted. Had the proposition of the motion of the earth been decided in the days of Galileo by the popular voice, this scientist and his friends would have been vastly in the minority. It is an essential feature of a scientific society that every communication presented to it should be subject to free critical discussion. Such discussion not only enlivens the proceedings, but is generally instructive, frequently eliciting facts which, though insignificant when isolated when brought together, mutually illustrate each other and lead ultimately to important conclusions. Among the things to be avoided are merely verbal criticism, undue harshness on the one hand, and unmerited praise on the other. Regard being had to truth rather than to victory or mutual adulation. There is nothing perhaps which marks more distinctly one of the characteristics of a true scientist than the manner in which he receives and appropriates to his use the critical remarks that may be made upon his communications. In conclusion, I would say that with so many facilities as exist in the city of Washington for the purpose of science, this society would be derelict of duty did it fail to materially aid through communion of thought and consort of action the advancement of the great cause of human improvement. Submitted by Joseph Henry, first president of the society, November 18th, 1871. Ordinarily, we read the minutes of the previous meeting, and we ask the audience for any corrections or comments thereon. However, tonight, I think, since Joseph Henry is not here to defend himself, we will move on to the rest of the evening's agenda. Hmm. Some of which I may have overlooked. We now turn to tonight's president lecture, and it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Margaret Lyman. Margaret is the director of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography and vice chancellor for marine science of the University of California, San Diego. She also is a science envoy for the U.S. Department of State for Latin America and the Pacific, and she is vice chair of the research board of the Gulf of Mexico Research Institute. Before coming to UCSD, she served as Vice Provost for Marine Sciences at the Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute of Florida Atlantic University, as Vice Provost for Marine Programs at Rhode Island University's Graduate School of Oceanography, and as Assistant Director for Geosciences at the National Science Foundation. Margaret's research focuses on paleo-oceanography, paleoclimatology, and biogeochemistry of the ocean. She was among the first to identify the importance of biogenic and aeolian contributions to the trace element geochemistry of deep sea sediments. She also worked on deep sea hydrothermal systems and discovered the first hydrothermal vault 
vents on the Juan de Fuca Ridge. And she's done considerable work defining ocean carbon fluxes and the relationships between ocean ecosystems and these fluxes. Margaret previously served as president of the American Geophysical Union and as president of the Oceanography Society. And she chaired the atmospheric and hydrospheric section of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. She is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the Geological Society of America, and the California Academy of Sciences. And she has been awarded Distinguished Alumni Awards by the University of Illinois, Oregon State University, and the University of Rhode Island. She earned a BS in Geology from the University of Illinois, an MS in Geological Oceanography from Oregon State University, and a PhD in Oceanography from the University of Rhode Island. And as you'll notice, all three of those institutions awarded her Distinguished Alumni Awards. Please hold questions for the question and answer period at the end of the lecture. And join me in welcoming Margaret to the podium. Thank you so much, Larry. And thank you to the Philosophical Society of Washington uh, for the opportunity to talk with you this evening. Um, and. Uh, and also, thanks for reading those uh, comments from the very first uh, uh, the, the first presentation, the first meeting. Uh, it often, you know, we tend to think that uh, the the particular set of uh, issues that we're dealing with today are so unique to uh, to history. And uh, it always uh, serves us to remember that uh, these same questions, especially regarding the role of science in society and the role of scientists in society, uh, come around and around and around. And uh, uh, you know, we should probably uh, try to do a better job of learning from the, the history of those. Uh, I'm going to. Uh, uh, I'm going to talk to you tonight about some of the ways that developments in other areas of science, and especially some of the technologies and the capabilities uh, that they uh, have, to, have uh, made possible, are really transforming the field of ocean science and our understanding of the ocean. And this is also combined with the fact that oceanography is a fairly young science and that it's really only been uh, for the last maybe 60 or 70 years that we've had the ability to observe the ocean and and therefore have the ability to look at how it's changing. And so our perception of how much the ocean is changing and how rapidly it's changing uh, have really undergone a great deal of, uh, of development just within the last 10 or 15 years. So we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. And uh, I'm going to turn first to one of the uh, most distinguished uh, oceanographers uh, who happens to be at Scripps Oceanography. Walter Monk uh, joined us uh, over 75 years ago. Uh, he just celebrated his 100th birthday on October 19th. He has an active ocean uh, um, uh, Office of Naval Research grant. Uh, through which he is modifying Lord Kelvin's equations. Just a small project for your 100th year. Um, he has really been a leader in encouraging us to look at how we observe the ocean. And one of the things that he reminds us constantly is that the last century, in spite of being the one in which we really began to observe the ocean, was the one, was a century of undersampling it and, and trying to make uh, great interpretations about uh, the way that the ocean works from really very little data. Uh, another uh, truly uh, inspiring leader from Scripps who has uh, contributed so much to the field of climate, so much to the field of, uh, 
of science and support of national defense, Roger Revelle, uh, uh, really a founder of University of California, San Diego as well, reminds us that great periods of oceanography are often defined by new kinds of instrumentation that make it possible for us to see things that we haven't seen before. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about those two themes of undersampling versus what we can do now and new technologies and what they bring to oceanography and tell you a little bit about the insights that, we're, we're, uh, uh, that we now have about the oceans. So the first example that I'd like to give you is a really important one for, for the oceans and has to do with the, the heat content of the oceans. We've known for a long time that the heat resulting from, uh, from carbon emissions, fossil fuel emissions, and warming goes into the ocean. And we've also known for quite a long time that 90% of that heat goes into the ocean. And what this uh, little graph from the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Fifth Assessment in 2013 shows is the amount of heat from 1970 to 2012 uh, uh, on the planet uh, and the amount of heat that was increasing as a result of fossil fuel emissions. The light blue uh, portion here is the upper ocean, essentially the upper 2,000 meters of the ocean. The dark blue is the deep ocean. That little white band is the increase in heat in ice and ice sheets. Uh, the yellow is the, the land and the tiny little bit of purple that you can barely see there is the atmosphere. So all of our discussions that, that uh, you, you tend to hear in the news and tend to hear in popular science uh, about climate change and about the warming aspects of climate really reflect a, a just a very, very small percentage of the warming of the planet as a whole. And most of that warming is taking place in the ocean. It's buffering us from very much uh, stronger uh, thermal impacts that, that we would feel without the ocean. So this was only five years ago, and at, uh, at that time, that was the best that we could do in talking about where the heat from, uh, from fossil fuel emissions was going. And I also want to point out these two dotted lines which represent the upper and lower limits of the error bar. And the error bars and were primarily the error bars on the ocean because it's such a large portion of the heat. And the reason that the error bars start decreasing is that that, uh, that earliest portion, the 70s and the 80s, uh, it was really a time when our understanding of the heat in the ocean was based on uh, ship measurements. And uh, the kinds of measurements that are, are being made by the, the oceanographers here uh, going out on ships like the ones that we operate at Scripps and, and covering uh, the ocean in uh, cruises, uh, sometimes close, uh, closely spaced, more often uh, widely spaced both in time and, and distance, uh, to try to come up with uh, the, those pictures of the time series of heat in the ocean. Since then, however, uh, the community that has been working on the development of new technology for the ocean has really been busy developing, taking advantage of the whole uh, area of uh, autonomy to develop uh, autonomous floats that can make measurements in the ocean. And what you're seeing there in those, uh, those little spiders crawling across the ocean are the deployment of autonomous floats uh, by now over 28 countries, uh, starting with uh, the floats that you see on the, the left-hand side developed at Scripps Oceanography uh, in the 1990s. And if I can make this 
go here. Um, those, those floats um, make their measurements by being uh, essentially deployed from uh, ocean ships. They sink to about 2,000 meters depth in the ocean. They float at that depth for about five days, then come up very rapidly, making measurements on the way up, therefore giving us a profile of the temperature and the salinity of the ocean, and also, of course, giving us the, the location that they've been through, and sending that, that information back to land. So we're now, there, uh, there are now almost 4,000 of those floats operating globally, uh, every five days sending a profile back uh, in contrast to what we had before, which was on the order of a few hundred profiles each year. So I'll call your attention to this again. Remember, five years ago, this was what we knew about heat in the ocean. This is the current state of our knowledge. The last 10 years, of measurements of ocean heat from Argo floats. Uh, not only now can we start giving you a map of the, the uh, uptake of heat by the ocean, but we know that there are, that although most of the ocean is warming, there are actually portions of the ocean that are cooling, largely in response to the circulation of the ocean. We can also give much tighter um, error bars on the heat taken up by the ocean. Uh, I've concentrated on, on heat here from the temperature record, but we also are able to see the changes in precipitation globally that are reflected in the salinity of the upper part of the ocean. We're actually able to measure the melting of the ice sheets in Antarctica from the impact on the the upper 2,000 meters of ocean and the salinity of the ocean. This has utterly transformed the way we look at the physical circulation of the ocean and the kinds of physical measurements that are represented here. Uh, next up for the, the program is to go to full ocean depth. I told you those measurements were made in the upper 2,000 meters of the ocean. Uh, we've now developed uh, new uh, sensors that are able to go to full ocean depth, uh, and the goal is to document changes in the deepest part of the ocean that changes more slowly but is greater in volume and has a much greater overall impact long term on, on the temperature budget of the planet. Recently, Paul Allen's foundation provided, with, provided NOAA with $4 million to purchase the first uh, array of deep Argo floats to add to the Argo array. So we expect that within about five years, we're going to be able to start telling you about the way that the deep ocean is changing as well as the surface ocean. So large, dense data sets like this are radically transforming our understanding of really the most basic components of the ocean with new insights that are going to allow us to understand not only processes, but the evolution of those processes just at the time when we need that information most. I'm going to give you another example that comes from looking at sea level rise. So this is our traditional way, uh, it has been the traditional way of looking at uh, sea level rise until the 1990s. All of the, all of the squiggly lines here are from tide gauge records and that was the principal way that we had for understanding the sea level and, and the changes in sea level with time. And we've been, when, been uh, measuring sea level from tide gauges for 100 years or so, but it wasn't until the 1990s with satellite altimetry that we could put together maps of sea level rise that made sense uh, uh, and were dense enough in data to be able to see the, the variations in sea level rise. So the first maps that, that really showed 
the, the global change and the distribution of sea level rise uh, didn't come out until about, uh, also about five years ago. Mark Merrifield from, from Scripps uh, published this first analysis of uh, the satellite data in 2014. And one of the things that you see is that that picture that we had in the past of uh, a uh, highly variable but constantly increasing uh, uh, sea level, uh, when you look at it distributed across the planet, is very different. And uh, certainly different uh, here in San Diego where I am, uh, where there was very little change over this period uh, of uh, a couple of decades uh, in sea level compared to the Western Pacific where sea level was rising at, uh, at 10 times the rate of, uh, of the Eastern Pacific. And we'll come back to some of the reasons that we think that, that that's taking place. But even this, uh, when, when, when pulled apart more completely, uh, we see that the, even these patterns shift. Uh, so if you take that 20-year uh, that record and just look at the last 10 years, you see that there's been quite a shift between the early part of the record and the late part of the record with sea level rising much more rapidly in the eastern Pacific now than in the western Pacific. And all the dots on there are the tide gauge, gauge stations that are used to calibrate uh, the, the, uh, uh, the satellite data. And our best understanding of the forces behind these regional changes in sea level uh, have to do with natural variations in um, uh, in the ocean caused by what we call the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. It's a major change in the distribution of heat and a major change in the circulation of the ocean that, that we've been uh, aware of for about 40 years. It, op it operates at about decadal scales and the, uh, during the, the warm phase the equatorial regions uh, are very warm compared to the North and South Pacific, and it's exactly the opposite in the cool phase. So part of this uh, impact on sea level rise is the steric anomaly, the, just the, the uh, expansion of seawater itself, and this, uh, and this uh, PDO plays out in the upper waters of the ocean. So part of it is the expansion of seawater with warming, and part of it is the circulation, the piling up of water in the western Pacific compared to the eastern Pacific. So again, it's only been in the last decade that we've been able to understand that sea level doesn't just rise like a bathtub, that it actually has regional differences, and that this whole question that we've been talking about with uh, the impact of sea level rise on coastal communities is going to vary with time, and it's also going to vary with, with place. We never would have known this without the, uh, the satellite data together with this, uh, the data that we have from tide gauges. So a di very different example, in this case satellite versus autonomous vehicles, but one that's completely changing the way that we look at the ocean and the way that we think of it as uh, uh, a much more complex uh, part of the Earth system. Uh, another uh, uh, characteristic of, of change in the ocean that you've just begun to hear about is ocean acidification. The, um, we know that, that CO2 is increasing in the atmosphere. The, the curve that you see on the right is the concentration of CO2 at Mauna Loa uh, from 1957 uh, when the observations began. They were started by uh, uh, Ralph David, or by uh, David uh, Keeling from uh, Scripps Oceanography. Uh, after starting them at Scripps Pier in 1952. And this record of the increase of CO2 in the atmosphere is really one of the foundational uh, data sets 
uh, for modern climate change. But that CO2 does more than just result in warming. It results in changes in the chemistry of the, the atmosphere and the ocean. About 25%, a little more, just a little more than 25% of that CO2 dissolves in the ocean. And just like the, uh, the CO2 that's dissolved in your soft drinks uh, makes the ocean slightly more acidic. And, the, and so uh, the, the ocean, be, the surface waters become slightly more acidic. The pH uh, goes down slightly. And what you see here is a record of that measured uh, since the late 1980s, uh, just north of Hawaii at a time series station there. On the top, these are measurements of CO2. The red curve is the Keeling curve, so that's atmospheric CO2. The blue, and, and more, more specifically, that's the CO2 as measured at Mauna Loa in Hawaii. The blue are the measurements of CO2 in the surface water at a station just north of Hawaii. So you can see that as the atmospheric CO2 increases, it dissolves into the ocean and the ocean CO2 increases. And on the bottom, the same um, uh, measurements, uh, but now P pH instead of just CO2. Um, the orange dots are measured pH. The green are the pH calculated from dissolved inorganic carbon and the alkalinity of the waters. So the point is that as CO2 increases in the atmosphere, it increases in the ocean, and it drives down the pH of the surface waters. They're still, the, sur the surface waters of the ocean are still alkaline. We're talking about a difference from about uh, 8.12 down to uh, about uh, 8.10. Uh, but because it's a log scale, the ocean is about 30% more acidic than it was in 1850. So we've known about this trend since the, uh, since the 90s, but it wasn't really until uh, the mid-2000s that we began to understand the impact of that on the biota of the ocean. And the little figures at the top are images of a marine, a microscopic marine snail called a pteropod, and they are um, this is a, uh, a pristine shell of that marine snail, and this is what happens with that shell as it uh, encounters um, lower pHs and actually has, it's not that the shell itself is dissolving, it's that the organism is having, uh, le is less able to make uh, a pristine shell. So it's the impact on the availability of the, the uh, carbonate ion to actually construct the shell. And so since the, the early 2000s, uh, we've been aware that this was going on, but it wasn't until 2005 with a Royal Society report of a workshop that put together the pH record that we were beginning to see and the, the impact that we were beginning to see on, on um, the biota at the microscopic level, and then later uh, the impact on coral reefs, which also make their skeletal material out of calcium carbonate. So once again, uh, a, f a phenomenon that was really only called to our attention uh, a little over 10 years ago, and yet one that we believe has the potential for substantial change in the ocean. I can't even show you a map, however, of the, the pH uh, in, in the, the ocean and its change with time because we haven't been able to make enough measurements to do that. And so uh, about uh, four years ago, um, 
the X Prize Foundation uh, issued a challenge to oceanographers to develop a new sensor capable of rapidly measuring the pH of surface waters of the ocean, uh, both at moorings very accurately, and also on those autonomous vehicles that, that we uh, explored in the very first example. And uh, here's the, the whole group that, uh, that shared in the prize. There were prizes for uh, the, the most uh, stable sensor. There were prizes for the most efficient sensor. There were prizes for the sensor that worked best on autonomous vehicles. The uh, prizes for the sensor that worked best on moorings. Uh, Scripps won the prize for the the uh, pH reliability and accuracy on autonomous vehicles, and had done that showing um, this, ex uh, in addition to having uh, in-water tests showing these data. Let's first look at the little map here. That's the Hawaiian Islands, and what you see here is the track of an autonomous vehicle uh, that was um, uh, moving northeast of Hawaii uh, over a period of a year and a half and measuring pH autonomously in the upper 400 meters of the water column. So this is that record from zero down to 400 meters from October of 2013 until May of 2014. And you may be able to see the little dots that were all of the measurements at the various depths. The three profiling floats that sampled here made more pH measurements than had been made in the previous 40 years in the North Pacific. And so, once again, it's this revolution in our ability to actually make measurements of the ocean that is revolutionizing our ability to understand how this, this process of acidification of the ocean is going to play out. And once again, just uh, in amazing examples of how recently this has happened and how much the field of oceanography uh, is going to be changing as a result of it. The last example that I'd uh, like to give you that has to do with really the physical ocean uh, like this uh, is another uh, three-syllable word that you're starting to hear. Uh, it's been reported on uh, a lot in the last year, and that is the deoxygenation of the ocean. And it's not deoxygenation everywhere, but in some very critical areas. So the ocean has a natural minimum in oxygen concentration at about 200 meters depth, and that's a result of uh, metabolic activity that goes on there, both from uh, plankton and from microbes that are metabolizing the organic carbon sinking out of the sunlit surface areas of the ocean uh, that's been, been made by phytoplankton. So at that metabolic activity uses up oxygen and generates an oxygen, a natural oxygen minimum. But in most places in the world ocean, that oxygen minimum never goes to zero, and it never goes uh, to, to um, oxygen concentrations that are low enough to really affect uh, fish or other uh, uh, metazoans within the ocean. That is beginning to change, and the map that you see here is put together from all of the oxygen measurements that were made uh, comparing the time period of 1960 to 1974 with 1990 to 2008. <clears throat> and once again, you're seeing kind of large uh, chunks of time in order to get enough measurements to be able to uh, uh, to make a comparison. The uh, colors that are pink are increases in the uh, dissolved oxygen in the uh, at the 200 meter depth range, 
and the uh, blue colors are decreases. So across almost the entire tropical area of the ocean and some of the areas um, uh, in extra tropical regions, uh, the, um, the amount of oxygen in midwater depths has decreased substantially. In fact, the area with very low oxygen concentrations, less than 70 uh, millimolar of oxygen, has increased by over 4 million square kilometers in the last 40 years. And we know that this is a result of um, biological activity rather than uh, physical consequences because we also have ways of measuring the, the apparent oxygen utilization by the biota. And the upper panel here is showing at the same depth range the oxygen utilization at those depths. And so you see oxygen utilization increasing and oxygen concentration decreasing. So the, what's happening, uh, again, this, uh, there are multiple causes of this. One of them is the warming of the ocean. So at warmer temperatures, uh, microbes, bacteria, metabolize more. So they're they're um, turning over more rapidly and consuming more organic carbon and therefore consuming more oxygen. Uh, but it's also uh, a result of more organic carbon moving into those depths. One of the, the impacts of this is that we're starting to see that oxygen minimum layer in the, the ocean become so low in oxygen that it, it has uh, forced uh, larger organisms, fish, to start moving away from that area, having to move up or down in the water column. So it's changed the range of the niche of many uh, metazoans, many uh, uh, fish species in the ocean. And so, again, we don't have, uh, we don't yet have enough information to be able to fully understand the impact of this, but it's only been uh, in the, uh, again, in about the last decade that we've understood that the changes that we see now are not just temperature, not just salinity, but also the pH of the ocean and its oxygen content. So very rapid changes, 50 years changing something that is the largest ecological zone on the planet, uh, and we're only really aware of it in the last 20 years or so. So physical exploration, even with uh, new instruments is often not enough to achieve an understanding of what's going on. You can see here that a key to this is not just making the measurements of today, but under comparing those with measurements in the past to understand changes in distribution, but also changes in process. This requires much more data that we've than we've used in the past from, uh, from conventional seagoing vessels and really demands a, new, a whole new approach to looking at the oceans and to measuring the, the characteristics of the oceans. So I'd like to turn now to a different kind of revolution that's taking place in our ability to understand the ocean. And this, uh, I, I think one of the best examples of this comes from biology and comes from the area of corals. And one of the reasons that I chose this example is because of the acidification that I talked to you about and the concern that's been raised about the, the health of coral reefs and whether warming and bleaching of coral reefs and acidification of coral reefs uh, is going to cause so much pressure uh, on those, uh, those ecosystems that they will, they will uh, change very rapidly or collapse. So that's a, a question that is being asked of the entire community uh, now and one that we can't answer right now, but we have to be able to answer. 
So how do you detect the impact of individual kinds of stressors like pollution or warming or physical disruption or acidification uh, in a complex ecosystem when all four of them may, might be going on in, in some places and not in other places? Uh, a real key to this, uh, or it's turning out that a real key to this, uh, is, is really uh, combining photo surveys of whole reef systems as opposed to individual organisms uh, with the lab studies that are going on looking at individual organisms. So uh, the examples that I'm going to show you are from Palmyra Atoll. It's about five degrees north uh, in the Pacific Ocean and just south of the, the north end of the Hawaiian island chain. And uh, for the last five years or so, we've been doing photo surveys uh, from uh, using divers and autonomous vehicles over large tracts of the, the, um, uh, the um, coral reef uh, at Palmyra to be able to start unwrapping this, this problem of multiple stressors. So a key piece is first, how do you take photo surveys and make sense of them and turn them into data that you can use? And what you're seeing here is digitized data from those photo surveys. And it's 3D because we can actually use all of the angles from, uh, from a photo that's been taken, which uh, on the sides, of course, can see the sides as well, uh, whereas at the, the nadir point is seeing a, a perfect vertical. So uh, this image is a portion of the reef that's about 10 meters by 20 meters. All of the photo surveys have been turned into digital data. This data set has five billion data points. Uh, I'm, what I'm showing you is actually a video off of a monitor because I can't, there's not enough processing power here to be able to look at the five billion data points together. But taken together, they give us an extraordinary ability to look at the entire reef and to be able to start to understand what's happening. So step two is being able to identify each and every uh, individual coral species and its distribution. So hard and soft corals are digitized uh, and they're, they're identified to species digitized and designated a unique color for, for each species. Uh, then we use machine learning to teach the computer to identify them uh, without us having to go in and, uh, and look at the five billion data point set in, in order to do that. So the computer identifies both the the species and the aerial extent of the species. And we've developed that in collaboration with the UC San Diego Qualcomm Institute uh, using machine learning techniques. So this is a portion of that same five billion data points set that I showed you, now uh, categorized by computer uh, into the distribution of a variety of different species in the data set so that we can go in and look at the changes with time. So obviously the next piece is that we have to look at that uh, with time. And I'm going to give you a couple examples of how valuable that's been. Um, in 2014-15 uh, winter was an El Nino year. It was a very, very substantial El Nino in the Pacific. Uh, and it had a tremendous uh, associated bleaching effect on corals. Uh, bleaching of corals is not necessarily death of the coral. Bleaching is really uh, the, the coral becoming so warm that all of the, the um, symbiotic algae, the zooxanthellae in the, or, in the um, uh, coral, uh, leave the coral 
and and so they're, since they're the ones that have pigment, the coral is left colorless, and so you see the white skeletal material underneath it. And the uh, if the bleaching event is uh, is of short duration, the the uh, coral. Um, uh, body material uh, is still uh, viable and when the bleaching event, when the temperature goes down, the zooxanthellae go back into the corals and they just start growing again. Uh, but if it lasts a long time uh, or the, the heat is sufficient to affect the coral body itself, uh, then the coral can die. So this is a few examples out of that data, out of uh, repeats of that data set uh, in September after the, the El Nino bleaching of, of event and in May of the exact same location on the coral reef as identified by both the, uh, the uh, uh, computer uh, location and the, the species identification. And so in this case, uh, this large table coral, that's something that's going to be probably about uh, uh, 50 centimeters across, uh, was not able to recover and uh, here by May that table coral had died. In contrast, uh, this uh, other table coral, which was also bleached, recovered totally, and by May of uh, 2016 uh, had come back. Here's another example of a more complex form that had bleached and was growing uh, very well by May. Another example where an area had bleached by May, not only had it recovered, but there was regrowth and, and growth, uh, extended growth. Um, Jen Smith, uh, who did this work, studied over 450 individual coral locations on 50 islands in five island chains across the Pacific. Uh, her work published in the, uh, the Royal Society, the Proceedings of the Royal Society, showed that those coral reefs that have uh, fewer stressors, especially pollution and both uh, uh, nutrient pollution and uh, uh, pesticide or, or, other, or heavy metal pollution, uh, have been able to rebound from uh, bleaching effects very substantially. Uh, so the most direct relationship between corals not being able to recover from bleaching and the entire data set was those coral reefs that have physical, that have chemical pollution, as well as bleaching and acidification. Uh, but the, uh, this work is uh, continuing with. Uh, uh, this is uh, now that same uh, area in three different. Uh, time periods, 2014, 15, and 16. And what I'm going to do is, if I can, there we go, <coughs> is uh, go back to, there's 2014. And I want to call your attention to the two big uh, areas here. The top one is bleached, the bottom one isn't. And now we'll go forward into 2015 with very substantial bleaching all around that area. And now we're going to go to 2016 when uh, very substantially recovered. The whole lower left there, if you compare that one and that one, uh, has regrown. You'll also see that in the upper right. And I'll give you another example. We're going to go into a, an area here. It's 2014. Now watch what happens. Boink! Uh, the, the, uh, that coral not only was bleached, but, uh, but was uh, physically disrupted. 
And then we'll go into So where's 16? There, this is a good one. There's 15 and 16 with regrowth. So these kinds of results take us into a position where we can, we can certainly use laboratory results where we control uh, individual stressors or individual parameters. But it's only when we look at these complex relationships that we can start to get to the point that we can ask different questions. We can also combine that with other new technologies. This is a, a three millimeter field of view of two adjacent corals of two different species. And uh, let me start it over because I want to explain to you what's going on. Okay, so uh, you have one species on the left uh, that forms uh, polyps and another species on the, the right, whoops. Uh, uh, these species do not exist next to each other naturally on reefs. So what we did to try to understand what was going on was artificially put them next to each other. When the species on the right reached out to touch the other one with its polyps, the one on the left everted its gastric organ. Uh, sorry for after dinner. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and released uh, its uh, acidic gastric juices all over the one on the, the right. So this is aggression at, uh, at a scale of three millimeters. It's an in situ uh, deep water ocean microscope that can be put in place for long periods of time, uh, takes very little storage uh, for this, uh, and uh, you can observe what's happening uh, on real reefs in, in a, uh, a way that we never could before. So if we put this together with lab data and then these really game-changing images that we can manipulate and compare and register in order to understand what's going on, we can ask a whole new set of questions uh, that are much more profound ones. What is the total calcium carbonate uh, uh, fixation and the, and the carbon uptake of a healthy reef system, not an individual, not a specific species, but the system as a whole uh, compared to one under stress from bleaching or compared to one under physical disruption or acidification. Uh, we can look at how much total carbon is lost during a bleaching event, how much what, what's the impact of all of this on the carbon budget of the ocean as a whole, and how do, long does it take to be restored? And most important, which species are the most resilient to each stressor? You saw that even in the face of an event that had enormous impact on the, the Great Barrier Reef, that at Palmyra, that assemblage of corals was able to recover very substantially from a huge bleaching event. Why is Palmyra so re resilient and the Great Barrier Reef less so? Those are the kinds of questions that we need to be able to answer in order to answer the question of what are the impacts of acidification going to be? What are the impacts of, of heat going to be? We can't just do it in the laboratory. So this is another area where we've totally transformed our ability to not only look at what's happening, but ask a whole new set of questions about what's happening. Uh, Another example uh, I'd like to give you is, is a, a different approach to, um, to understanding what these data tell us. Um, 
But this is uh, Scripps Pier, extending out from the campus into the, the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and at the end of the pier, uh, we've been taking measurements of the very surface water of the, the nearshore Pacific for 100 years. This is uh, a sea, we take sea surface and salinity records, uh, among a variety of other things that we take now, but for 100 years we've measured the temperature and salinity. It's um, one of the longest uh, ocean time series, and it's the longest one on the Pacific Rim. And we still do it exactly the same way, in part in, in order to make sure that we can fully compare those records to pr the present day, but also because getting just the surface water requires a hand-done hand measurement as opposed to an instrument which is sitting there uh, uh, reflecting changes in the, in the state of the tide uh, and the, of the sea level uh, as a result of the tide. So for uh, most of that time, oceanographers have been trying to look at those records and understand whether they can tell us about the red tides, the harmful algal blooms that occur in our area. And uh, this is really a very large area. Uh, that's a ship. Uh, uh, so that gives you a sense of the magnitude of the harmful algal blooms, which certainly are a nuisance for, for tourism, but they're a much uh, bigger nu nuisance for uh, their health effects and their effect on, on fisheries in the area. So since the 80s, the shore stations have included measurements of chlorophyll A, the, the pigment in algae, or the primary pigment in algae, and people have been looking for clues from that record of, of whether it's related to harmful algal blooms. And on the right-hand side, you see the time series from 1984, to 1993, and then from 94 to 2011. The blue uh, is the temperature uh, recorded at the shore station, and the green is the chlorophyll A. So when this first started, people started seeing hints of chlorophyll going up when temperature went down, and there was a lot of discussion about um, exactly what might be uh, what might be causing that upwelling events and so forth uh, but um, all of those efforts proved fruitless in terms of being able to get a predictive capability for harmful algal blooms uh, until recently when Hao Shi of George Sugihara's lab modeled the data with Sugihara's empirical dynamical modeling approach, which is uh, essentially uh, applying uh, techniques reminiscent of empirical orthogonal functions to time series data. Uh, John McGowan, who had been studying this time series for his entire career uh, and is now in his 80s, uh, together with Shi and Sugihara and their team, found that this e ecologically complex system looks random, but that the data allow us, if we do time series analysis, to be able to see that the system actually sets up weeks in advance of the harmful algal bloom. And they were able to take a, a period that included 12 um, bloom events, remove it from the, the data set, develop a predictive algorithm, and then predict those 12 events that were not part of the, the time series. This is the first uh, time that we think that we have some tools to be able to predict a very complex uh, set of events that have eluded us in the past by actually letting the data tell us what was going on rather than strictly uh, approaching this from a hy hypothesis testing point of view. And now uh, we're applying uh, that same microscope but now uh, uh, 
um, deployed on the pier uh, to look at the organisms themselves. Uh, it's been out for about a year and now has over three million images for us to consider. So of course this is going to be a machine learning and AI uh, challenge as well. Uh, but uh, now we want to combine that information about the nutrients, the temperature, the salinity, the chlorophyll, with who's there uh, to see how the specific organisms responsible for the harmful algal blooms set things up uh, in order to generate those blooms. Again, things that we have never been able to do before because of new technologies and new, uh, new um, uh, computational uh, technologies as well. I don't know why it wants to give me the weather. <laughs> Maybe we can, oh, hopefully we can get rid of that. There. Um, the last uh, piece related to, um, to collecting data and new ways of thinking about this that I want to, to uh, talk about is crowdsourcing data. So remember that we uh, have developed a new sensor for autonomous vehicles uh, that can actually measure pH. And uh, what we're now doing is developing uh, a sensor-enabled fin that would go on a surfboard. The, the fin exists and it currently can measure uh, temperature uh, and location from the surfboard and a beta version has a pH sensor and the idea is to be able to crowdsource this so that we can get some of the data that is most difficult uh, for an oceanographer to collect and that's the data that is near shore uh, in a highly variable environment. It's philanthropist funding and the goal is to get measurements but also draw the attention of the, the surfing community and the public to the problem of ocean acidification. Uh, we're beginning to see more of this in virtually every aspect of ocean science, whether it's um, crowdsourcing photos of reefs uh, in order to be able to get time series of them, whether it's crowdsourcing measurements uh, at times of uh, severe storms, uh, storm surge, run up, et cetera. Uh, and uh, that too is a new development in the field of oceanography. Uh, before uh, the last maybe 10 or, or 15 years, um, the sensors themselves were so sensitive that most scientists wouldn't accept the data of somebody, the uh, data generated by the public because uh, they couldn't guarantee that the sensor was stable and that the data were good. The improvement in the sensor quality and the data quality has allowed us to move to the point where uh, measurements are being made that are being used routinely uh, by the scientific community. So uh, the last thing that uh, I'd like to uh, talk about in this vein is the way that these data sets allow us to explore new ways of doing our science. Recently, I've been reading Andrea Wolf's wonderful biography of Alexander von Humboldt. And, and uh, looking at the differences in the way that some of the huge insights about the natural world evolved during the late 1800s and the early 1900s in comparison with today. Uh, von Humboldt was one of the people that was responsible for our understanding of the, the uh, relationship between species distribution and altitude. So he measured the distribution of species on the mountains in Europe and then went to South America and was stunned by the fact that the distribution of species mimicked that in a totally different area uh, across the globe and put it together that the, the variable here was altitude and of course all of the things that go along with it like temperature and wind and, and so forth. But 
those early insights really came from a wealth of observation as opposed to carefully constructed uh, experiments. The, they were there as well, but if you think about those kinds of observations, the observations of Darwin, they were based on letting the, the uh, observation of nature tell you about something. Now, in comparison, those were fairly simple kinds of observations and simple insights compared to the questions that we're being asked today. But for not all, but much of the observation of the ocean and, and in, in general the, uh, the natural environment during the 20th century was hypothesis driven. Uh, form a hypothesis, uh, develop a sampling strategy and a measurement strategy based on, on being able to demonstrate that hypothesis, uh, met, uh, get your data, and, and determine whether the hypothesis was, um, was true or false. But the hypothesis drives the sampling strategy and other insights may be precluded as a result of the sampling strategy and the design to answer the specific question. And I think that what this huge data revolution gives us is the ability to look at some of these very, very complicated interdependent, multi-parameter, uh, multi-stressor in the case of, of corals questions uh, in a new way. So I'd like to spend, um, because the importance of uh, this new revolution in our ability to observe the ocean brings us to this issue of data. Uh, I want to spend just a few minutes at the end of this talk talking a little about data challenges. So uh, I think that in much of the world, people focus on the issue of how much data there is. And, uh, and there certainly is a lot more being generated than, than there was in the past. The number of in situ ocean profiles per year increased from about 6,000 in 1900 to about 50,000 um, in the 2010s. So two orders of magnitude increase in data. You know, compared to genomics or astronomy, that's not much. The quantity of inc uh, data increase, but processing ability has as well. But ensuring that time series data continue is another matter. So earlier in the talk, I showed you this, this curve. Uh, it's affectionately known as the Keeling curve after Charles David Keeling, uh, who started it. Uh, there have, it's been going since, 2000, or since 1957, uh, but there have been four times uh, during uh, this time that it was almost closed down. Uh, each time was uh, a time when people said, oh, we know it's increasing. It looks like it's doing about the same thing. So uh, is this science? You know, do we have to continue? Uh, do we have to keep monitoring this? Uh, and uh, uh, so imagine where we would be uh, or where we will be in the future thinking about the impact of whether we have been successful in controlling fossil fuel emissions if we don't have this kind of record. Uh, so, uh, and, and this is probably one of the most iconic time series in all of ocean and climate science. So now think about some of those others, like the tide gauges. And uh, uh, Marcia could tell us a thing or two about, uh, uh, about the struggles at USGS and uh, continuing tide gauge measurements. Uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, me measurements uh, like the, the Scripps Shore stations uh, went through three times uh, in the last 25 years where we really struggled to be able to continue something even as simple as a surface measurement of um, uh, uh, from from that. So one of the, the real challenges for us in a field where the kinds of questions that are being asked have to do with the, the long-term impact and whether the processes are continuing as they did in the past or are changing 
is the continuity of time, of time series. And this is one of the foremost challenges associated with data in, in ocean sciences. Um, so, so I talked a little bit about that. Um, ensuring that data are accessible, and by accessible I don't mean just that they're on the web, but that you can actually figure out uh, where the data are, what uh, what data are where. This is a little screenshot from the U.S. Global Change Research Program primary uh, uh, pointer system for climate change reports and the data therein. And uh, I know what to make of this, but I've showed it to about five different people, ranging from my neighbor to somebody at Scripps that doesn't work in climate. And uh, it would be very hard to figure out what's there and how to how to get it, and no less uh, being able to manipulate the data. So, uh, as we talk about um, data being uh, much more data being available and the importance of being able to also look at it in your own frame. So my frame now is Southern California. People here are probably more interested in uh, the Chesapeake or the, the uh, uh, Atlantic seaboard. And so uh, being able to access, uh, access data that is relevant to your own problem. So our data capabilities now create opportunities and responsibilities, and I've talked about a couple of those, but I think that the funding associated with data collection demands that scientists explore it. And we're certainly seeing much more attention to this by Congress and by funding agencies. Uh, you've spent all of this money collecting really high quality data are you using it? Are you making those measurements, uh, making those measurements pay off? Uh, the amount of data that has been collected and not studied, I think, demands uh, open source opportunities. We certainly are seeing the pressure on that, uh, again, f uh, in the U.S. from Congress and from, from funding sources, uh, but internationally as well. And uh, we, we start seeing more and more that, that uh, the data sets that are on, online and are openly accessible are being downloaded much more by the international community and by players that aren't uh, the, the people that we normally look at as the major players in, in for example, in our field in, in ocean science. But they're people who are aware of the problem and we desperately need them to start looking at, at this uh, data as well. And then I think the, politici the politicization of science that we see now and that we were seeing back in the 1800s uh, really de demands vigilance and stewardship of data to ensure that, that it's there uh, and it's well taken care of. So in this big revolution that, that we're seeing in our ability to look at the ocean and and answer new kinds of questions about it. Some of these fundamentals are absolutely essential, and I think that uh, many areas of, of science uh, are experiencing these same kinds of pressures, uh, but I wanted to call attention to them and to, uh, uh, to highlight that. So um, we, we work as, uh, as do a wide variety of other organizations across the country to understand and protect the planet and investigate uh, all of these aspects of the planet that, uh, that affect the oceans uh, and to find solutions to some of the greatest environmental challenges. And those challenges are now challenging us to go way beyond tools and techniques uh, and strategies of analysis that we used even uh, very effectively, even as as recently as the 90s, to to say no. In order to answer those questions, we need new approaches and much more global understanding of the ocean. Thanks very much.
So we do have time for questions, and we have a procedure for questions, and that procedure is that there are three runners with microphones. There's a red microphone, a blue microphone, and a green microphone. And if you have a question, would you please raise your hand high enough and long enough for somebody with a microphone to see you. And when they bring the microphone to you, please stand, tell us your name, and whether or not you're a member of PSW, and ask a question. And Marcia can make a speech, but everybody else, please <laughs> ask a question. I think it's on. You just need to hold it close to your um, lips. Okay. I'm Marcia McNutt. I'm a member, and I'm president of the National Academy of Sciences. So, Margaret, very troubling about this deoxygenation zone. How does that affect all of the animals that migrate through it diurnally? Um, so, Marcia is uh, probably referring to the vertical migration of plankton, and especially of zooplankton. Uh, they migrate from, uh, they spend uh, time in the, the uh, at night uh, up in the surface waters, and uh, where they can uh, be in the surface waters and not be seen by their predators, and then during the daytime they migrate vertically down. It's a great question. We think that the uh, vertical migration in some areas, we have some evidence that vertical migration is being compressed so that, that uh, zooplankton are not migrating as far vertically, that they're not going in as deep into the, the oxygen minimum zone. In others, that doesn't, we, we're not seeing that effect. We definitely are seeing effects on larger fish uh, and the, the abundance of larger fish in the, the uh, lowest oxygen zones uh, is much lower than it was previously, um, to, be, to be determined. Question over there. Would somebody bring a mic to the man with his hand in the air? The blue mic. My name is Dave Hum. Uh, I am not a member of the Philosophical Society. Um, I had two questions, a very specific one and a very general one. The specific one also has to do with the deoxygenation. I noticed in your map that the oxygen had increased almost everywhere in the Gulf of Mexico. It was a very unusual spot, and I was wondering if you could explain to us what's going on there. And then the second question, the general question, would be, do you have any policy recommendations to address maintaining long-term scientific data sets that are consistent over time? We, we think that the Gulf of Mexico uh, situation is because of more vigorous circulation in the Gulf, uh, and more vigorous circulation and mixing in the Gulf. Uh, the, with respect to um, time series, I think that, that the key thing is that uh, it's probably going to have to be a partnership between those generating data and those who have been funding that data. Those generating data be able to explain uh, in scientific terms what it is that you get for the next set of measurements. Uh, people hate monitoring. It's like, uh, you know, I'm going to stick my finger in over here, and if something, and I won't pay any attention to it, but if something happens, I'll look at it. You know? And that's kind of, uh, you know, Congress utterly abhors that. You know, it's like, okay, I'm just pouring money into that until something happens. Uh, but it's very different if you're continuously looking at, at what you learn from those measurements and, and how they evolve with time. And I think that is very true of most of the, the long time series measurements that we have. But I think the other piece is that uh, we probably haven't done as good a job explaining the value of what you learn from looking at evolving processes 
uh, that, that, than we should have. Uh, that it's not just a question of I'm looking at it because something might happen in the future. I'm actually learning about processes that take place over, you know, months, years, uh, decades, uh, longer time. And that only by having that record can I explore in time as well as space. I have one question from online here and then we'll have another question from the uh, Admiral. We have a couple questions from online. We have two specifically. The first one is from Preston Thomas. Um, Preston is working with Bruce Howe at the University of Hawaii. He says, you began by describing the recent dramatic improvements in sampling quality um, from ships to Argo and now deep water floats. What additional benefits can we expect from further improvements in sampling technologies? In particular, do you have any comments on the initiative to add ocean observing sensors to future undersea fiber optic telecommunication cables? Uh, I think, uh, let's first talk about uh, autonomous vehicles. Uh, there's, uh, there are, the big movement now is to try to find ways to add sensors to those autonomous floats that would give us information about biology. So about 10% of the Argo floats have oxygen sensors, and since oxygen is used by biota, it's a proxy for biology, but it's not a direct measurement. Uh, so there's a lot of discussion about using uh, optics, acoustics, um, uh, DNA fragments, et cetera, and, and adding those to autonomous vehicles so that we can start putting this new knowledge together with looking at, at biological um, impacts. Uh, I think that the other, so that's, you know, um, giving us a, a distributed uh, sense of what's going on. I think that the other thing that you could see from the examples that I gave, like the shore stations, that individual sites, whether those are moorings or fiber optic cables, uh, give us a different kind of perspective. They give us uh, a sense of the evolution of a particular area. And I think that's the big promise of being able to add new capabilities to uh, sensors on fiber op or new sensor capabilities on fiber optic cables. Um, they give us different aspects of, of the changes that we see. The second question is from Joel Wilson, who is a member of the society. He says, you mentioned the upwelling of deep water to surface regions as part of the normal cyclic movement of oceans. I understand the deep water is carbon rich. Do we have a bound on how much carbon is contained in deep water? Because it would seem that it, with the upwelling of deep water that is carbon rich, that adding to the human generated carbon footprint would add impact to the climate. Do we have bounds on that? Not yet. And that's, uh, so the, the reasoning um, that the questioner went through is reasoning that's very familiar to all of us. The big problem is that we just don't have the measurements. And I think you could see from the, the distribution of heat map that I showed, that uh, uh, that if if um, uh, CO2 and pH are as unevenly distributed as is heat, that it's going to matter a lot uh, where upwelling takes place and how intense it is. I have a question up here. Oh, you already have a microphone. Thank you. Microphone. Uh, I'm Tim Gallaudet. I'm the acting NOAA administrator and I'm appointed as a deputy NOAA administrator. And I'm also a Scripps graduate, but not a member of the society, but maybe hope to be one soon. Uh, well, but that would uh, be most excellent. Uh, yeah, I enjoy I will that. I step you through the application process. It's great, it is great to be here. <laughs> I enjoy all the science-y questions, but I'm going to talk about the policy aspects of long-term ocean observations. And, uh, and in fact, I'll, I'll share with you an exchange I had with Secretary Ross, my boss, the Secretary of Commerce today. In fact, I sent him a weekly report, and the input I had from my staff was about the 20, or our newest strategic plan for our integrated ocean observing systems. And of course, what I, I received was, hey, we released the strategic plan. It's a great thing because we're going to understand the ocean better. But that wasn't quite what he wanted to hear. And so what I had to sort of editorialize is, is that the fact is that these sustained ocean observations are going to allow us to do a couple of things. 
One is to better support national security because we just released the national, newest national security strategy. Uh, a m number of other departments like Department of Homeland Security, Department of Energy, Department of Transportation, my Department of Commerce, uh, as well as key contributions to our maritime critical infrastructure and this growing maritime private sector, which we kind of collectively call the blue economy. So the key is, is there is a policy and political gain here that is the onus is on me and the community to better communicate to the administration and to the Congress. Uh, so we're underway on that, and I look forward to your help in doing that. Great. Um, Tim, uh, uh, that's a wonderful observation, and uh, if this was a different audience, I probably would have started with a number of questions that are the kinds that were asked by policymakers and cab drivers or, or rideshare drivers. You know, like, yeah, how many of us, if you say you're an oceanographer, are the coral reefs dying? Uh, uh, you know, are, are we going to, you know, are we killing all the fish? Or are we taking all the fish? Killing them, you know, with pollution or taking them with, with fishing? Uh, are we, you know, na name your big question like that. And they're absolutely fundamental. Uh, you know, um, with deoxygenation, we know metabolically uh, that, that uh, under low oxygen, lower oxygen conditions, not even anoxia, uh, that fish metabolize more slowly so their body mass is smaller. So if we increase the oxygen minimum zones, are we decreasing the body mass of fish? You know, that's a, a major question. It's directly related to fisheries. We have no idea what the answer is. And those are the kinds of questions that, that we really need to be talking to uh, policymakers about, you know, you want the answer to those questions? This is what it takes. Exactly. Thank you, Margaret. Bob, with the green microphone. Bob Hershey, I'm a member. Uh, could you tell us more about what you're doing with acoustic sensors? Yes. Uh, so, some examples. Um, you know, um, most of you that have a, a friend who is a fisherman know that that uh, fish finders are essentially acoustic devices. Uh, they work because uh, fish have um, different kinds of bladders, some filled with air, some filled with oil, some filled with liquid, uh, all of which have a different acoustic signature uh, and can be used not only to tell you that there are, there's a lot of something there, but in many cases there's a lot of this kind of something there. Uh, so we have just been working with NOAA uh, to establish what we call the acoustic toll gate on the west coast, uh, which is a set of buoys uh, along shore, immediately along shore and offshore that have um, uh, uh, that have uh, active acoustics. Uh, low, low, low frequency active acoustics uh, that actually are, are being able to measure the abundance of fish moving up and down the west coast. So we have the, the yearly migration of the anchovy and sardine. We know that they're down south in the summer and they're up north in the winter, but it makes a big difference to fishermen whether they're down south off Baja or they're down south off Santa Monica. And this will help us understand in a much uh, better way uh, what, what we can do with that. Uh, we also think that, that for moorings or for fiber optic cables, that acoustics may be uh, a good technique uh, to use for looking, uh, for being able to uh, monitor uh, biology in a more general sense. And then finally, uh, there's passive acoustics, uh, which are being used very, uh, uh, very much for uh, understanding marine mammal migration, marine mammal uh, health, and so forth. So uh, basically, we have uh, a few tools for biology. We have acoustics, passive and active. We have 
optics, both in the sense of imagery and the in, in, in the sense of light and light scattering. We have DNA, and I didn't really talk about that today, but uh, anything that, that lives in the ocean uh, or dies in the ocean uh, gives off DNA. And we know that, that that DNA is viable for about two weeks in the ocean. So the ocean is not a repository of the DNA of everything that's lived in it, but it's what's been there recently. Uh, and uh, right now, uh, there are techniques that are being used that are very, very cheap, uh, just taking uh, water samples and looking at DNA fragments, combining them with what we know about what's called the barcode of life or the census of marine life to be able to tell what's there. Uh, there are high school students in New York that are doing weekly water samples in the Hudson River. Not only can they tell when the fish are migrating in and out of the river, but they also t tell New York uh, fisheries about species that they didn't even know were in the river uh, from, from very, very cheap techniques. So that, that sort of handful of techniques are, are what, is, what the new approach to biological observation is going to be built around in addition to, you know, conventional, traditional techniques. Question with the green microphone. Right. Thank you very much. My name is Ellie Bors. Um, I'm not a member of the society. I'm actually a Canals Marine Policy Fellow at NOAA, uh, so the Admiral is technically my boss. <laughs> um, but uh, I wanted to ask you a little bit, um, I'm a recent graduate of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, um, and there we see a big trend of philanthropic funding of research. Um, we have uh, Eric Schmidt with the FALCOR. Um, you mentioned pa Paul Allen in one of your slides. So I'm wondering if you'd speak a little bit about what you think the effect is of philanthropic funding of science, how that affects things like uh, instrumentation and technology development and, and data management. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, it's welcome. You know, the, the community is, is uh, delighted that, that uh, you know, some of the big nonprofits um, that have traditionally not engaged in basic research uh, are starting to get interested in it. Uh, I think that what, the characteristics of philanthropic funding, not, at least now, are that it's very focused. Um, it, you know, it's, they're looking for answers to very specific kinds of problems. Paul Allen's very interested in, um, in conservation, in marine conservation, in, uh, and uh, in, in understanding the, whether the policy decisions we made about marine protected areas make sense. You know, are those going to be effective? Uh, would they be interested in uh, the development of an instrument that could measure nanoparticles in the ocean so that you could understand their optical scattering? Maybe not. And yet, uh, that's been absolute, that develop, instrument development was absolutely essential to being able to take the next steps on being able to use optics for uh, understanding the very smallest of uh, the biota, uh, you know, the microbes, the bacteria, and the viruses, which are most of the living things in the o ocean. So the, the difficulty is that uh, in comparison with agencies that take a really long view and that say, I don't have to have something that appears in the newspaper tomorrow or at the end of this, well, we'd like to have something that appears at the end of the cruise, but it's not the end of the world if it doesn't. It's a contribution to the science uh, that, that uh, it, it's a lot more focused. Uh, an, another thing, and uh, it's always, uh, uh, I'll take a deep breath and just say it. Um, the uh, philanthropic organizations do not provide indirect cost recovery to, um, 
two universities. Uh, they usually will pay maybe five or 10% administrative costs. They're assuming that the university is keeping all of that technical gear going, uh, keeping all the buildings uh, operated um, just because they're a university. Uh, but um, it, it costs money on the, the indirect side to do all of that. It's a, it's a major thing. You know, uh, the government doesn't give away indirect cost recovery without incredible auditing. And anybody that has been through an audit knows how, how long and arduous they are and that they, have, they document that it costs, you know, roughly somewhere between 40 and 60 or 70 percent. Uh, to support that research. So a big concern is uh, if that becomes a major piece of what we're doing, how are we going to support the indirect costs of research? Having said that, we really appreciate the, the interest. <laughs> well, they do like to build, build buildings. Some do, some don't. <laughs> I'm Jim McCormick, I'm a member. Um, and I actually had the uh, beautiful opportunity to work at NOAA for two years, so I got to see some of this. And I think what you said about the inductive approach is really the magic that I saw at NOAA compared to my career in DOD. Folks in the field with limited resources, a lot of creativity, just doing some amazing things from Canals Fellows on up. Um, but I think the, uh, the potential risk when we talk about policy even Do you the, have a question? I do. Okay. And so, so I'd like to hear more about your ideas on the uh, inductive method, specifically considering that the folks that might want to politicize the science are maybe better at that than you could ever be. <laughs> <clears throat> well, uh, you know, I, I didn't argue that we go away from um, hypothesis testing altogether. It's that, you know, I think the balance went uh, in the, certainly in the last half of the 20th century, the balance went way over toward hypothesis testing. And the idea that you were going to, um, you know, sort of troll through data with something in mind, but uh, see what it told you would, would not get you very far. And I think that what's happened is that we now realize how much of an imprint we put on the result by the design of the experiment, and that that's that's the big the big issue. You can't, uh, you may not. I shouldn't say you can't. You may not see something that is really an important factor because you just haven't designed the experiment in a way that you can see it. Uh, so you know both are necessary. So I think that's it for questions. But before you go, I want to give you a gift and thank you for thank you. Um, go out the oh, okay. Thank you for uh, coming here and spending the evening with us and giving this lovely talk. That would be a framed copy of the announcement of your talk signed by the members of the general committee on signed behalf by everybody on behalf of the membership okay and Thank you. a signed copy of volume one of the bulletin of the philosophical society of washington and does this have the the full yes, unexpurgated version it does the, it has the, the full unexpurgated that's great thank you So just a few closing announcements, housekeeping items and the like before we adjourn the meeting to the social hour. So first, um, if you're not a member, how many of you are not members? Raise your hands. Oh, how distressing. <laughs> but you can, you can remedy this, this awful situation very easily. You can just go to our website and you'll see, uh, it's a really awful website, but we're in the process of redoing it. You'll see the, um, the membership button there, which will pull up a form, which remarkably is the application for membership. And if you fill out the form, you'll get to the bottom and it says submit the form. And you'll come to a payment page 
You can use any credit card you want to pay. Don't be fooled by all those PayPal <laughs> copyrighted uh, logos that seem to indicate you have to use PayPal. You don't have to use PayPal. And once you do that, your um, application for membership will be forwarded to the general committee and the membership chairman will look it over, do a background check, uh, see how financially well off you are, what your educational <laughs> background is. No. <laughs> What? Well, it's a, how do you give just an unsolicited donation on those pages? We're, we're button. We're on the button. Robin, we're on the button. Do you? <laughs> Make a donation. Yes. Okay, so you press the dues 2016-20-17 button, it pull up a form for paying dues or making a contribution. You click the toggle that says you've already paid your dues and then you enter the amount you want to pay and then you'll get a credit card payment screen and you fill that out and you're done. So really, membership is open to anyone with an interest in science and I promise you there's no IQ test. And we welcome your membership, and I encourage everybody here who's not a member to please join. The next lecture. Come on. Well, we're having a lot of technical problems tonight. I don't know why. The next lecture. And the 2387th meeting will take place on Friday, January 19th, 2018 at 8 p.m. right here in the Powell Auditorium of the Cosmos Club. The speaker will be Aviv Regev. She's a professor of biology at MIT. She is a core member and faculty chair of the Broad Institute, and she is a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator. She will be speaking on the catalog of cells and their diversity. She's a fantastic young researcher who's developed methods to do whole genome expression profiling on single cells in large numbers of cells in parallel. Her work is rewriting our understanding of how many different kinds of cells there really are and how much a given type of cell varies in its gene expression profiles as well as other characteristics in response to its normal life cycle, in response to the environment. It's a very interesting work that she's doing and well worth hearing about. So I encourage you all to come. The spring 2018 schedule is almost set. And as of now, the speakers will be, in addition to our next speaker, Christopher Ralston, on February 9th. And he'll be speaking on faking cultural heritage, in particular the Israeli forgery trial. He's a brilliant linguist, capable of rubbing a few feathers with the facts. He likely will be telling us about the trade in antiquities and in forgeries, including how we detect them, and about the ways in which antiquities frauds impact scholarship, and when these antiquities have religious significance, how they impact religious communities and believers. It's not always what you might expect. Religious communities sometimes know that a sacred object is not what it was originally believed to be, but nonetheless continue to revere it for what it symbolizes. It also promises to be an interesting talk. On March 9th, we have Thomas DeBurchin of NASA, and he'll be speaking on a topic to be determined. But I suspect it will have something to do with exploring space. On March 23rd, Andrew Nall of Harvard will be speaking on about life on Earth, the deep history on identifying and studying fossils that constitute the remains of the earliest living things. It's a subtle and challenging art, and I'm sure you'll find it interesting to learn about these far distant relatives, or maybe they're not, of ours, and whether and where we might find the residual of even earlier forms of life on our planet. To ask, answer the question, how did life come about? How did it change into us? And perhaps how it is arising or has arisen on other planets. On April 6th, we have Jordi 
Puig Swari of Cal Poly, who is an inventor of CubeSats, and not surprisingly, will be speaking about CubeSats and about the revolution that they are bringing about in uh, space communications and eventually exploration. And then finally, on May 18th, uh, we will have a Cassini special series of lectures. As I'm sure many of you know, Cassini spent many years in this system of Saturn, telling us a great deal about dynamics in that system, about its moons, opening up new windows on where life might be in our solar system, and recently plunged into Saturn and is no more sending back data, which is sad. Um, especially the beautiful pictures it sent back. It's uh, quite an amazing feat. And, and we hope to have several of the primary movers in bringing Cassini to light, sending it to Saturn, keeping it working there, bringing the data back and interpreting it to talk about what we've learned from that uh, flagship exploration vehicle. Finally, the social hour ends at 10.30, so you better hurry up. <laughs> After that, PSW members and guests often repair to the Fairfax Hotel across the street, across Mass Avenue, where we continue the discussion. If you are interested in that, please see Corresponding Secretary Robin Taylor, back to the room, uh, Vice President Lloyd Mitchell, oh, he's not Vice President anymore, <laughs> Membership Chairman Lloyd Mitchell, or me, um, please use the site entrance to exit the build building, and I will now accept a motion for adjournment of the 2386 meeting of the Society to the Social Hour. Is there a member who would like to make that motion? Bob, do I have a second? Okay, second from Marsha. All those members in favor of adjourning to the Social Hour, say aye. aye. All those opposed, we are adjourned to the Social Hour. <laughs>